So our next installment of our Get Wisdom message series is The Way. And, um, you know, did you ever hear that phrase, The Way? Did you know that's what Christians were called before they were called Christians? They were called The Way or followers of The Way. Um, There's a Bible called The Way now. There's some people that still identify as The Way. There's a church in Aurora called The Way. Um, But where did that come from? What is the way and what does it mean? Well, the origins are actually found in the Old Testament. And here's a couple of examples from Isaiah. Uh, Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears uh, will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So the way simply meant the way of God. And in, in long before Jesus came, um, there were people that used this title. This, in the Old Testament, people used this title to identify with being people that followed God's way or God's path. And um, Christians, early Christians, just kind of um, revived that terminology and appropriated it to being followers of God and through Jesus. So we see this path terminology um, all through Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. Example in the Old Testament would be, thy word is a lamp unto my path, a light unto my feet. Uh, In the New Testament, we see the narrow path uh, that leads to life. Um, And then in Proverbs alone, there's 31 times that, um, 31, there's 31 times that uh, it, it refers to the right path, the straight path, as opposed to the crooked, wrong, bad path. So that's kind of what the way is. And um, in Acts 11, then, we see that uh, in Antioch, it's the first time that they're called Christians. So what precipitated that change? Why did they go from being called the way, for the most part, to being called uh, Christians? Well, I'm not sure there's a really clear answer to that, but I believe, I, I believe it's really self-evident that um, it was based on Jesus' own words. Like here's an example in John 14. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this statement Um, has huge significance. The words Jesus chose to use in in this context um, had huge significance. For example, he used the words, I am. Well, in using the words, I am, Jesus was identifying himself as God. Because if you remember, um, back in Exodus 3, this is the name that God gave himself. Remember when Moses... Uh, was God came, appeared to Moses and he said, hey, I want you to go and uh, tell my people that you're going to deliver them. You're going to lead them out of Egypt. And Moses was like, okay, well, but what if I go to them and they ask me, who sent me? You know, what, what's his name? What do I tell them? And God said, I am, that, I am that I am. And he said, tell them that I am sent me. So God the Father gave himself the name I am. And Jesus appropriated that name. He used that name here. Now, if there's any doubt about that, about that being what Jesus is doing here, there's even a clearer example earlier in this letter from John. Back in chapter 8, um, Jesus was arguing with some Jews, and he was saying to them that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And the Jews were like, well, you're not even 50 years old, and you're telling us that you've seen Abraham? And Jesus' response to them was very strategic. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, if Jesus was just trying to say I existed before Abraham, he would have said something like, before Abraham, I was. 
But he chose the words, I am. And the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. And that's obvious by their reaction. They, that was blasphemy to them. And they flipped out and they picked up stones and they were ready to kill him. Check it out. It's in John chapter 8. Um, but Jesus slipped away. He got away, thank God. So if anybody ever says to you that um, uh, Jesus never claimed to be God, this, this is just a couple of examples of many where Jesus very clearly was saying, I am God. I am God in flesh. I am God made flesh. Emmanuel. <clears throat> then Jesus, I want to point out, said, I am the way. Now here again, his choice of words are very purposeful and they're very meaningful because like I just said, uh, the Jews knew what the, the way meant. It meant following God. It meant the way of God and it literally meant the way to God. That's how they understood it. It was the way to God. Jesus doesn't say, I know the way, does he? He says, I am the way. I am the way to God. I came to earth not to show you the path. I came to be the path. Now you have a person to follow, not just a path to follow. Then he says, I am the truth. Not I know the truth. He said, I am the truth. And in this context, if you keep your Bible open to the book of John, mainly I'm going to be talking about uh, John 14. But in this context, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In fact, earlier in chapter 14, Philip says to him, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. You know what Jesus' response was? He was like, Philip, don't you know me? Here again, very clearly identifying himself as God in the flesh. Then Jesus says, I am the life. Now, Jesus claims to be not only eternal life, but abundant life here on earth. In Matthew 19, he says, <clears throat> Anyone who gives up the stuff of earth to follow me, they will receive a hundredfold here and eternal life in the life to come. So you get both. Okay, so I want to introduce kind of another idea um, concerning this topic of the way. Um, we went from being called the way or followers of the way to Christians, which means followers of Christ. But there's something that kind of mucks up the works when it comes to being a follower of Christ. And if we look back to Isaiah, God spoke through him. This is the father speaking through um, Isaac. He said, Isaac, Isaiah. <laughs> I don't know where I got Isaac from. Um, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, notice the use of the word ways here. See, God's ways, his path, his thinking is not like ours. It's not. In fact, it's infinitely higher than ours. So let's ponder that for a second. Um, let's think about the transcendent nature, this transcendent nature of God. Now, um, we can kind of get our head around how big the world is a little bit. You know, if you were to think about walking from here to New York, you go, wow, that's Big, that's a long way. And that's only a fraction of the size of the earth, right? So the earth is big, but it's actually pretty small um, when you compare it to the sun. Here's a, 
actually scale image of Earth compared to the sun. The Earth is that little speck of blue to the right. I had to say Earth or you would have just thought it was a dropped pixel, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the sun is a lot bigger than the Earth, isn't it? But did you know that the sun is only one of 400 billion stars in our galaxy? Just one of 400 billion, in addition to planets and all the other stuff that exists in our, our galaxy. Now, obviously, our solar system is too, uh, uh, our, our solar system is too small when comparing it to the galaxy to even see it on here. It wouldn't even appear as a speck of dust. So our galaxy is unimaginably big. It's ginormous. But did you know this galaxy with its 400 billion stars is only one galaxy in somewhere between 100 and 200 billion other galaxies in our universe? This is an actual photo from ultra deep space uh, that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And if you could identify the spot in space where they took it, it would appear only as a pinprick. So there's hundreds of galaxies here. We're not looking at stars, we're literally looking at galaxies. If you can see some of the spiral arms and stuff like that. Now think about this. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies and in each of those galaxies, there are hundreds of billions of stars and planets and other types of matter and energy. <laughs> Think about the intelligence and the power that God must possess to be able to have spoken that into existence in an instant. And that's what science tells us, that all of that came into existence from nothing in an infinitesimal point of time. Boom. What kind of God must he be? His ways of doing things, his path, his thinking, it's infinitely higher than ours. He's infinitely smarter than us. He possesses all power. It belongs to him. Now, let's bring this back to our little galaxy and to our little solar system and our little planet back into this little room. What's the significance of all that? Well, I just, I really wanted us to have a grid for what we're dealing with here because it's that God that's the one, the one whose ways are infinitely higher than ours. He's the one who said, follow me. And we're like, wait, what? I can't follow you. I can't think like you. I can't be holy like you. Your ways are infinitely higher than ours. You know, and in a lot of ways, that's true. We can't. Now we see dimly as in a mirror, it says in 1 Corinthians 13. But don't think of a modern mirror. You have to think of this in context of what he was talking about. Mirrors back then were just a piece of polished metal, you know. So basically he's saying, your, no matter how wise you are, your ability to see rea reality is just a poor reflection. It's a poor reflection of, of everything that is. But yet we, we, are, we can still follow him at some level. And we're definitely supposed to try. So the picture that I get about this is that this life is like a deep, dark forest. And... God gave us this path through the forest. Now, in the Old Testament, that path 
was the law. It was like a map that he gave us. Here, here's the way that you can navigate your way through this forest. But you know what? We weren't very good at reading the map and we weren't able to stay on the path. So what better way to save lost people than to come and get them, right? We're wandering around in this forest trying to read this map and we're lost. And then God came into the forest to lead us through it and eventually out of it, right? So that's kind of the picture I get of this. Um, since our, way, our ways are so much lower than God's ways, his are so much higher, he's so much smarter, um, wouldn't you agree that since he came to show us the way, it's wise to follow him, right? Well, maybe you're like, but I like the forest. <laughs> I like it here. It's beautiful. Green leaves. Sometimes there's even some fruit to eat. and I kind of like this forest. I'm not looking to get out. That's a cute sentiment, but then the reality of ticks come. I don't know if you've ever been in the Midwest and you go, oh, that forest is beautiful. Wow, let's go for a hike. Ah! <laughs> you know, and the bugs attack you and suck your blood and ticks under your skin and, <laughs> you know. Bears. <laughs> bears, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. <laughs> See, some of us think we love life here, you know, Maybe you just haven't been through a lot yet and you're like, I, I love life. I love it here. I want to live forever. They need to invent a way so people can live longer and maybe forever. Take my brain out of my head and keep me alive here. But then the reality, the bugs of life kick in and you're going, help. <laughs> right? Those bugs can be a lot of different things. Violence against you or against someone you love. Abuse, rampant abuse in this world of every kind. Addictions of every kind. Our own sin nature doing things that we really didn't even want to do. I didn't want to do that. Why am I doing that? I do the things I don't want to do and the things I want to do, I don't do. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Praise be to God. So the question we should be asking at this point is, how do we follow Jesus? What does that mean? Do you know that over 20 times, over 20 times, Jesus himself, God incarnate, Emmanuel, said over and over, follow me. Follow me. How do we do that? How do we follow him? What does that mean? Well, to understand that, let's look more at the context of John 14 and John in general. I, read that book, memorize that book. It's amazing. The context of this passage, I am the way, Jesus was actually comforting his disciples because he had just told them, he's telling them now, he's saying, look, I'm going away. Jesus knew he was going to be crucified. He knew that it was going to throw them into confusion. So he literally says in verse 29, all this I tell you now so that when it happens, you will believe. You won't be confused. There was still some of that, but then they went, oh, crud. Remember what he said? He said he was going away to prepare a place for us. In my father's house, there are many mansions. It's good that I go there because if I go there, 
I'm going to send another one, a comforter, someone who will teach you. He tells them how to follow him when he's gone. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. He says, even though I'm going away, the Holy Spirit will come and he will be with you forever. He says in verse 18, I won't leave you as orphans. He says in verse 19, the world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. How will they see him if he's gone? The Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but he starts with, if you love me, keep my commands. What's he saying? Keep the path. Stay on the way. Do what you see me do. Follow me. Follow me. Now that sounds like legalism, and a lot of people get twisted up here. That's not what he's saying. He's not talking about earning your way to heaven by following the path. He is the path. Follow him. We already know that the law doesn't work, right? Well, if it's not that, what is it? It's the way of the Spirit. It's no longer trying to follow a map or a physical person. It's more like having a GPS built into us. The Holy Spirit in us. Look at this. A few verses later. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I said to you. The disciples went from, the followers of God went from following a map, a path, to following a physical person to being led by the Spirit. Paul calls it Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now we have him on the inside. <laughs> How do we follow Jesus? It's the Spirit of God in us. He reminds us of the path. We say yes to the Holy Spirit. That's the answer. We, we become the kind of people that we know God, we know the Spirit, and we say yes to him. That's why the Bible says, walk with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Keep step with the Spirit. Be governed by the Spirit. So this concept of God in us is incredibly important, you guys. It's incredibly important. So I want to actually close with a, th a few thoughts about this. Tish, why don't you come up? See, there's a couple things that I, I just want to point out. First of all, this week, for some reason, um, I've been just really tuned in, like not even trying to think about it, just keeps bugging me. I've been really tuned in to the concept of loneliness. It really fits this picture of, of the forest. I think... I think God's saying to me that there's a lot of people that are deeply struggling with, with loneliness. So it could be that you're single and you just want someone to love you. You want to be loved. You want someone to do life with and process with and have conversations with. But it was definitely clear 
to me and my soul that this wasn't just about that kind of loneliness. You know, you can be in a crowd and still be lonely. You can be surrounded by people and still feel that way. You can be married. You can have children. You can have a large group of friends surrounding you and still have some deep longing and loneliness in you. If that's you, I want to pray for you this morning. I want you to perceive this community of people who love you. I want you to perceive God's love and the nearness of God. Because God's closer to you than your skin. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God is near. And the other thing that I'm going to invite you to respond in a minute, but I also want to address, this is another thing that's been on my heart. Maybe you don't know the way. Maybe you're not following Jesus. It's possible that all this stuff sounds like gobbledygook. But this morning, in this room, in this space, right now, God is inviting you to come. You may say, well, but I'm messed up. I, 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 I'm really, I got all this. It doesn't matter. Listen to me. Just come. But Greg, I'm, I've got all, I don't even understand. I got all these questions. It doesn't matter. Just come. Jesus is saying, come. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. See, at the beginning of one of the passages we looked at earlier, uh, we see this invitation from God. Come. There's that invitation. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. See, that's the amazing nature of God's invitation and that's that that's the nature of the path that he's calling us to follow. You say, "God, I don't have what I need to follow your ways." He says, "I know." They're way too much higher than me. He says, "I know." Don't worry. This one's on me. I paid for it. <laughs> I paid for it. That's the metaphor here of I have no money. He says, come anyway, and I'll feed you. In your soul, in the emptiness, in the lostness, you're searching, you're looking, you're hungry, but nothing satisfies. God is saying, I am the food. I am the bread of life. Seven times, Jesus makes statements in John. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way and the truth and the life. Seven times, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am God. So this morning as we worship, um, I purposely left us 10 minutes. I just said, I told myself, I don't care where I am, I'm going to stop talking at 10 2. And we're just going to pray for each other. Come on, we're a family. So Tish is just going to sing a song of worship. And you know what? I just invite you, God is inviting you to come. 
So as a symbol of that, just get up off your seat. Walk up here. You can sit in the front row. You can kneel. You can stand. And you know what? Somebody will come and pray with you. If you don't want them to pray with you, if you just want to do business with God, just say, I just want to be alone with God. And they'll leave you alone, okay? Otherwise, let them love you. Let them lay their hand on your shoulder and just love you and pray for you, okay?